Hi, I'm Indra Monga. I'm the Director of Energy Sciences Network and the Division Director of Scientific Networking at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Let me share my presentation with you. And it's an honor to be able to present to you uh, as a keynote speaker. So I'm gonna to talk to you about analytics-driven networking, when the computer becomes the network. Now, you must be wondering, I've heard the famous Sun tagline, the network is the computer, but this is a bit different. Yes, it is intentionally slow, and it'll become clearer to you why later during the presentation. So let me talk to you and give some background where my perspective comes from and a little bit about Energy Sciences Network. Energy Sciences Network is a premier organization that heralded networking into the field by being one of the few nodes on ARPANET, connecting DOE labs with universities and through satellite connectivity to science organizations in Europe, in Germany and in Switzerland. As you see from the network, this is an October 1987 picture. LBL was being connected to Slack, UCLA, other universities through 56 kilobits per second and a protocol called X.25, which is not even deployed in any network anymore. Over the many years that ESET has been active, we have seen exponential increase in traffic. Just last year, last fiscal year in 2019, we carried more than an exabyte of traffic. Now, the reason why we go about this is not because we want to build the fastest network, but because our focus is on scientific progress and unconstraining scientific progress, no matter what the geography is. What I mean by that is no matter where the computational resources are, where the researchers are, we provide the data movement capability that allows them to do experiments, to collaborate, and to create the best science. And the infrastructure does not provide any constraint for the science to happen. Currently, DOE serve, uh, ESNet serves a larger research complex at DOE. It connects all of the DOE national labs together, experimental sites like CERN in Geneva, and all the DOE user facilities, whether they be light sources, environmental sensing, fusion reactors, we connect them all. Now, one of the things you might think is, hey, these guys have had exponential growth. Are they gonna to continue to have more growth? Actually, the traffic still continues to grow and not from the traditional sources, which are definitely growing as well but from user facilities like light sources, which have typically been low volume data users of the network. As you can see from the advanced light source, the advanced photon source at Argon, LCLS, LCLS2 at Slack, they are showing 10X or more than 10X growth in the next decade. One example, specifically the LCLS2 light source may produce almost 10 terabits per second from the sensor, which is then downsampled to one terabits per second for certain experiments. And this data has to be streamed to an HPC or a supercomputing center, which is not co-located so that the experimenter can do some quick processing. And that processing or analysis can show the scientists whether this is working well, uh, whether the experimental and, and uh, the sample is well-placed and they can determine how to change the experimental parameters in near real time to get the data they need for the science to happen. This capability is totally dependent on the network and streaming of that data from the experiment to a supercomputing facility. Similarly, there is another experiment on 4D scanning transmission uh, electron microscopy at NSEM in Berkeley lab. They have developed a very high frame rate detector that can be used to study how the materials used in lithium ion batteries can impact electrochemical performance. 
this is just an example of what these electron microscopes can be used for. Now, this detector is capable of a terabits per second data rate, but currently the detector is being operated at a low rate mode of 400 gigabits per second. And that also is connected to NERSC for processing so that we can make sense of the data as it is being produced. So you can see two examples of high data rate that will be dependent on the network to make this instrument successful. Now, high energy physics, which have been great big users of the network, they're also seeing a huge amount of data growth with high luminosity LHC. So the computing model is changing with the amount of data exceeding the computer computing power that the science can purchase and deploy. So they are now exploring the use of cloud bursting for adding almost double the computing power on demand when they need to. This was an experiment done with Google Cloud and 100 gigabits per second peering with the Google Cloud uh, with that experiment. You can see that networking is critical for such science to happen and supports some of the new computational models that these experiments are developing. Now, in order to tackle all of this, we are building a new greenfield network, ES106. The Greenfield Network is, building, is being built on 15,000 miles of dark fiber across the US. And one of the key elements of this architecture is actually the integration of compute and storage into the network. As I click through the animation, you see the high touch programmable data plane and compute in the smart services edge oval. The high touch programmable data plane and compute enables ESNet to provide innovative services to the scientists that goes beyond just high performance bit transport that we have been providing today. And this is one of the recurring themes that you will see throughout this talk and as indicated in the talk title on compute being part of the network or compute becoming the network. So let me give you a little bit more context and give an analogy to explain uh, on where, where some of my talk is coming from. So just think of yourself in the times we are. When you get high fever, that's when you go to the doctor. So if you think of it in a different way, most of us think of the doctor only when something breaks, which goes, something grows dramatically beyond ordinary. Now, network is treated as the same way as the patient example you saw before. We manage through alarms. There are network management tools that show how many are critical alarms or trouble or service down. We do do continuous monitoring of statistics. We have methods to do that. But the graphs are very similar to Fitbit, like health monitors, where you feel assured by watching the visual graph. It may give you some long-term planning in terms of weight or weight management or steps or step management. You may have some visual anomalies that you can see, but they don't really typically talk about health and you don't have any instantaneous way to use the data to know are you healthy or not? Is your kidney working well? Is your liver working well? These kind of statistics don't get to the core of your body and how it is operating. So the networks currently only offer crude statistical sampling and None of us know what's going on in the network with these kind of methods, just like we don't know what's happening in each of our organs. And if there is an error, we just say, hey, rest, and hopefully it'll get better. Similarly for the network, we say, hey, something went wrong, try again. Hopefully this will be better because we have no insight as to what went wrong based on the statistics we collect today and based on the monitoring we do today. Now, where the humans are going, are going towards something called a quantified self. There are a whole bunch of people that are keeping daily data and trying to figure out what's happening. For example, they're measuring heart rate and diagnosing the onset of sickness. So when the heart rate goes up, they know that there is an early warning of sickness. Two days later, I will get sick. They're correlating blood sugar with steps and monitoring this day in and day out lot of samples every day. 
Now the question from that becomes, what kind of telemetry or sampling do we need to scale and support the wide variety of applications that are coming? The autonomous cars, internet of things, the smart grid or the power grid connected to the network, or if you really want to think future, robots and some robots that may serve you coffee. In addition to that question, one of the things that we depend on or we are the tools that we have come to depend on in our daily lives is predictability. So if I want to fly to LAX and want to go to Caltech, I can look at the Google Maps and figure out this is going to take me an hour or 32 minutes, depending on when I land. And I can use that predictability or that information, the forward-looking predictability to plan my life. But the networks are not predictable at all. This was this experiment run by Globus by sending data across the same two endpoints, NERSC and Argon, over two years, and you saw how unpredictable networks are. The best effort delivery could mean worst effort delivery as well. And you can see a, a, the huge 10x amount of variability in network performance across the same network, same equipment, same all other conditions being the same. So the vision is, how do we build an autopilot for networks? We truly need to provide an analytics-driven network that takes data from sensors, just like an autopilot takes it from the uh, sensors on a plane, and provides the predictability, dependability, resiliency and recovery that the applications depend on the network for. So network needs to really step up and, and provide that. Now, as we were uh, defining the ESNet 6 architecture, we did create a software architecture for such an autopilot. This is an animated slide. The software architecture integrates orchestration, provisioning, telemetry, analytics, and machine learning. Now, the two most important pieces that I'm gonna talk in, about in, in, this, in this presentation are the telemetry and the analytics. Because the orchestration and the provisioning piece is largely a solved problem with many vendor products out there, many mechanisms out there, and these products and mechanisms are constantly being improved. While there is a gap when it comes to telemetry and analytics. So let me uh, quickly recap. The most telemetry we get from the network is either sampled or aggregate. The mechanisms of getting that information is not ideal for any kind of near-term real-time analytics. You cannot detect, just like I talked about the health example, is the flow is starting to go sick, like what you saw from the heartbeat. You can't determine the onset of sickness of any data transfer. The current data from the network is not sufficient for us to figure out these conditions. But the compute and processing and other technologies like the programmable network hardware, software-defined networking techniques, high-speed packet processing libraries have progressed enough that we believe we can get to this. I'm going to talk to you more about high precision timing as well. As the speed of the network links increase at 100 gigabits per second, there can be as little as 6.7 nanoseconds between packets that needs to be analyzed. So we not only need to get telemetry from all the packets, but we need to get timing, which is highly precision, which is go from microsecond precision to nanosecond precision. So the question is, how do we get this telemetry? One of the things you have to look at is the hardware that we need to acquire such telemetry at data rates that are typical of networks today. With an easy programming model like P4 and the broad availability of chips that you see on the right hand side, Spartnics, FPGAs, we think we have multiple cost effective options to get this telemetry. For ESNet, we have actually really done extensive evaluation of two things. 
Netronome SmartNix, which is, has been a prototyping platform, and Xilinx FPGAs, which is currently the product production platform of choice that we are working on. And that is based on a P4 implementation on the Xilinx FPGA platform. So let me talk a little bit about that. The, the specialized FPGA NIC that we are building uh, not only has a P4 packet processor, which you see here, but also can support approximately 1.2 terabits per second of IO and has a lot of processing capability as well. Now, this is a joint research project in progress with ESNet engineers, Xilinx CTO's office, as well as our computer science architecture research, the fabulous researchers at LPNL. Now, once you have a hardware that can capture telemetry, how do you actually deploy it in the network? So how do we integrate this high precision, high value volume telemetry in, in, in ESN6 architecture? Our current approach is to mirror packets of the network device. Since the system is still not hardened or operational uh, for inline deployment, and that could be disruptive. So we mirror the packets, get them into high touch servers that have the smart NIC and the software to process it. And then we use an overlay to get that telemetry data to remote servers where it can be processed further for either real time or saved for offline long-term analysis. Now, obviously you don't save every packet, you may save a reduced data rate or some kind of an aggregated data rate, depending on what kind of application that you are looking for. We are using or planning to use DPDK and Kafka to build an architecture to be able to capture, process, and share these telemetry products, uh, telemetry packets, or telemetry information across a large number of flows at a high rate. Now, you may be wondering, ESNet is carrying an exabyte of data. Are we gonna get an exabyte of telemetry? So how do we process such or so many packets on the network? I just wanna say that the telemetry packet is much smaller than the data flow because you throw the payload away. We are only capturing the data relevant to the packet or the telemetry. We still need high rate of processing, but not as much high bandwidth on the telemetry side of the equation as we need on the payload side or the TCP flow side of the equation. What you see here is our version one of the telemetry packet format uh, on, on what we're using. Now, once you start getting these telemetry pro packets, you have to build a way to process because you're getting telemetry packets across many flows. While there may be applications that may be only interested in one single flow or a couple of flows. The vision we have is telemetry as a service where we can support multiple applications simultaneously, be able to look at different flows and be able to make progress. This is using the fast Kappa uh, enhancement of DPDK architecture that we are doing, as well as using Kafka to publish topics and for different applications to subscribe to those to topics, get the flows, and then be able uh, to provide value in that application. Now, all this is pretty abstract, so let's make it real. This is one of the simplest example, two servers 10 gigabits per second NICs and one gigabits per second iper flow between them. We had this running in the lab to prove the concept. And we captured the flow data, which is telemetry of every packet that went between those two servers. And what we're showing you is a sample of 600,000 packets that we captured from this one gigabits per second iper flow. Now what you can see is each dot is an instantaneous rate. So you can see these microbursts. And you can see that even though the flow is one gigabits per second, the microbursts reach 10 gigabits per second, which is the line rate of the sender. Even a hundred packet average shows a steady one gigabits per second flow rate. 
we lose that visibility in our statistics that are highly averaged and not as precise, like the average you saw. So if you took a 100 packet average, you would see this line below and you would miss all these interesting microbursts that you see when you map every packet. Now let's go further and, and, sh and share with you uh, a continue on this example. So what if there was a 1% packet drop, which is 23 packets of the 600,000 packets are dropped. Now what you see is expected behavior from TCP. The average bandwidth or 100 packet average bandwidth drops from one gigabits per second to five megabits per second. While the microbursts go from 10 gigabits per second line rate to one gigabits per second. We know packet loss is bad. This is visual proof. So when you see terrible performance on your video conferencing, you know that might be the culprit. Unfortunately, right now, when you have such issues in your application or performance gaps, you cannot easily identify the causes or the location where such transient packet loss may be happening. And hence, whenever you complain of a performance, the, the most response you get from somebody is, hey, just try it again. It might be better. Or sometimes you, you see it's worse. Now, what else can we do with it? You can take the same packets and deduce condition control and how that algorithm behaves uh, in the network. Right now, as a wide area network provider, you do not know what TCP condition control mechanism the end hosts are using. You can determine that from this fingerprints and know what kind of condition algorithms are being used, how are they competing with each other, what kind of unfairness or bad behavior in the network is being seen uh, by these different uh, congestion algorithms. And if someone changes or uses something different, then we can see that as well. And this difference in fingerprint is almost visually apparent. You can also plot the inter-arrival times and the histogram and see how the TCP BBR condition control is very different from Cubic, which is loss-based. I just wanted to say that there are other applications possible, and these are not something that we have implemented yet, but we have imagined them. The research and education environment is a multi-domain environment. So always when there is packet loss between a source like an instrument and a destination like an HPC system, there are multiple networks in the way. And we want to know, or we want to be able to say, where is the packet drop happening? So we can deploy multiple such high touch sensors and be able to look at sequence numbers, loss, and actually tell you this is the router where the packets in, are being dropped because the queue is full and this is the queue that is full. And then you can examine and determine why the queues are getting full. And if you need to do traffic engineering or reroute traffic or change the way your traffic is routed. So these are the opportunities or new applications uh, you can develop with high touch sensors. Let me just summarize. What we have created is a packet telescope. And to use that analogy, you can see Jupiter with your bare naked eye but the difference in watching Jupiter with your bare naked eye and watching through a high power telescope is tremendous. You see features on the surface of Jupiter that you cannot see through your bare naked eye. And what we hope with this approach of building a packet scope is that we see features in the network that we have not been able to see before. And we develop mechanisms to make the network better by that observation. It will also give us more insights on how large-scale complex network with machine-to-machine -machine, as well as human-to-machine traffic behaves or could behave if we made certain changes. Now, you must be wondering, hey, Inder, you have showed us examples of watching 600,000 packets and visually determining how things are going. I absolutely agree with you. Visually determining problems is something that I talked initially to get away from. So we need to develop analytics and machine learning techniques for networking 
so we can get away from manually or visually or experientially through a gut feel know what's happening in the network. The two research themes being explored by one of our early career researchers, Mariam Kiran, is on how to predict congestion before we schedule large transfers and using reinforcement learning to deploy self-learning network controllers. So in the first use case, let's go back to the Google example. In the Google example, there are two things. You can know how, how busy it is, and you can see a map 24 hours ahead of time, which tells you, hey, 6 to 9 p.m. is when the traffic is most, 3 to 5 p.m. it's a breeze, or early in the morning. Now, can we determine similar patterns of the network? It is, in the essence, traffic. So while we don't have the high precision telemetry in place, what we have been working on, or Mariam has been working on, is techniques like LSTM, where you can leverage the traffic or real-time data from the network through Persona, SNMP, whatever NetFlow we have available, and determine whether we can build a 24-hour prediction model. Now, if you had that prediction model, you can uh, use it to build a new traffic engineered path for your big data transfer. Somebody wants to build a terabits per second, let's figure out which path can handle that. Or we may divide the traffic into three paths and send it fully occupying the link and really taking advantage of the bandwidth we have available. In case of hardware software maintenance, we can determine which path can take that extra traffic based on our predicted 24-hour uh, uh, model. And there may be opportunities if this model gets really good on raising alarms when we see anomalous behavior. We can use this prediction to also see real time when our real time traffic does not match prediction. And we can say, hmm, why is this so? The tool produced called NetPredict actually uses the Google Cloud Platform and streaming telemetry that we have in place today. What we have in place today is that every node in our network streams the information I talked to you about, SNMP data and flow data into the Google Cloud. And then the ML algorithms take the data which is going to the, uh, to the Google Cloud to use this prediction. Now we do understand that these techniques are new and are being developed and haven't been proven yet. So the, what we do is we provide a dashboard that builds confidence in the engineers. We show them predictions on what will happen and we build confidence when they see things happening, well, the, are the predictions accurate or not? And that is how we are using this tool today. I'm gonna to skip over the system architecture uh, on how this is done. And I'm hoping that you can view that as I click through that, this build. Let's talk about uh, the second use case, about self-learning network controller. Now, what we're trying to build is to build a controller that learns over time and updates its decisions on how it provisions the network. We used a Mininet model to develop that. And, and the reinforcement learning algorithm is in the controller that is controlling all the Mininet nodes. Now with this, and I'll turn uh, the video on, is you can, the, 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 the controller learns about the performance of the packets and may choose based on how things are performing to change the routing dynamically based on optimizing the metrics that we want to optimize the network for. It can provision different packet rules dynamically to say, optimize for delay, optimize for latency, and by learning uh, on how it is performing and what the intent is, we can automatically, the controller can reroute the packet traffic for optimal use. Now this was just presented at the International Conference on Machine Learning for Networking in 2019. Now, once you have these techniques, the question is, 
is this simulation good enough? How do you test these new ideas and scale? I know we don't want to test them like the Tesla autopilots where the people are trying to test autopilot uh, uh, on the road where they could put other people in danger. So can we give the researchers a controlled environment that will give us confidence in the tools as well as allow us to enhance them to be more effective? So we did get a, an opportunity to do so thanks to NS, one of NSF's 10 big ideas. One of the NSF 10 big ideas was mid-scale research infrastructure. And NSF realized that they needed to address their funding models to allow experimental research at scale. The project that came out of it is called Fabric, which is an adaptable programmable research infrastructure for both computer science research and science application research. And ESNet is one of the PIs in this grant. The Fabric is building a nation scale programmable network to not just for the computer science research, but also the next generation of science applications that may use this infrastructure to deal with the data tsunami that I've already talked about. This is built on top of ESNet 6, the architecture that I shared before, and it will have both dedicated 100 gigabits per second links, as well as dedicated terabits per second links to make sure that we can plan for our applications for the future to deal with sensors and huge sensor traffic. You can learn more about Fabric on whatisfabric.net. What I want you to remember is those blue circles or those blue dots. These are actually Fabric nodes and we'll learn more about the Fabric nodes in the next few slides. Now you're wondering, what is the use? Why Fabric now? What has changed is that we have now cheap compute and storage that can be put directly in the network. When the network architecture was designed 30 years, 40 years ago, processing was really expensive, memory was really expensive, and storage was not as high performant. They had floppy drives or, uh, or, uh, or floppy disks. But now with cheap compute and storage, we can actually build the network with com cheap compute and storage at every node of the network. And that is the fabric architecture. And what the opportunity we have for the networking research community is to push the boundaries of distributed, stateful, everywhere programmable infrastructure where compute, storage, processing is a fundamental part of every network node. Now, let me share with you what the fabric node looks like. Each fabric node is basically a management switch and a data plane switch that just does packet forwarding at scale and connects to the ESNet 6 infrastructure below. But what the experimenters get is this heavily powered servers, which have got storage, programmable NICs, P4-based NICs, FPGA cards, GPUs. So they can build applications, process packets, and build truly networked applications. There is also a facility to bring P4 or bring your own switch or uh, bring your own processor that you can place in the network. The above, the head and storage server that you see is for us to save telemetry from the infrastructure and your experiment so you can use the telemetry to actually do your research and analysis at a later point. The way we are defining this architecture is that this substantial compute and storage can be leveraged whether you want a bare metal access to the server or via PCI pass through for VMs and containers and for multiple applications to share that infrastructure. Now, depending on your experiment, you may be okay with sharing the infrastructure or you may want full dedicated server and network bandwidth for your experiment. There is a control and measurement framework being put in place so you can provision as many nodes you need. The VMs provide the Docker containers that can be deployed as well as get the measurement data from the experiment uh, to, for you to do your analysis. And this architecture shows you how the NICs are, being, are collecting that information. There's some packet aggregation going on and we are providing you 
uh, the 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 stack so that experimenters can get the measurement of their choice, filter it, and get what they need from the experiment. Now, I do want to say that as I as you have seen, the need for scale is changing how we manage, build, and operate networks. The data tsunami is, and the variety of applications is changing how we build networks. And what I really talked to you about the different transformation going on, and I'm gonna briefly talk about that. We are going from focused on network performance to end-to-end -to -end data workflow, data and workflow performance. It is the application and the application performance that rules. We are going from human manageable to automation. I talked to you about orchestration and provisioning. But what this talk really focused on is that we're going from managing the networks through experience, gut-driven, alarm-driven, to analytics-driven networking. And I hope that you agree with me that this is a gap that needs to be researched and solved, and then we can build much more capable networks that will take the applications that we have and the benefits of networking to the next level. To continue on my autopilot analogy, on the left-hand side, you see the picture of the space shuttle and the complex knobs and buttons that were exposed to the, uh, to the people going to space. They did have software and aut uh, autopilot capabilities, but it was much more complex to use. What we are trying to get to is the three pane simplicity that you see on the right hand side from the recent SpaceX mission uh, uh, outside Earth to space. This simplicity is what we hope the networks get to, where we can easily, through small number of schemes, manage the network and operate a really, really complex network with multiple applications, with different requirements. Now, all the ideas I talked to you about are just not mine. They belong to the ESNet team and the partners we work with. The high-touch ESNet 6 I talked about is Chin, Yatish, Richard, and Bruce. The FPGA BX or Berkeley processor that we talked about is not just Chin and Yatish, but Anna, Farzad, Gordon, and John Shelf collaborating together. And the AI and ML focus on networking through the early career research is from Mariam Kiran and her collaborators, Bashir, Peter Murphy, and Nandini. My co-collaborators in the Fabric project are Ilya, Anita, Jim Griffin, Casey, Dale, Tom, Paul, and Zongming. But these are just the leadership team. There is a huge big team that is building the software architecture, the node architecture, the topology uh, for Fabric that we are in the uh, process of building and really thankful to and excited about uh, uh, building with NSF. I hope you enjoyed my talk and I hope that I hear a lot of questions from you and look forward to hearing more from you. Again, I'm Inder Monga, I'm the director of ESNet and my email address is, is imonga at es.net. Feel free to send me a note if you have more questions, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you.